Namo tassa bhagavato arahato thamma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato thamma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato thamma sambuddhasa Aparuta de sang amadasa tawara ye sodavanta bamunchantu satang. So listening. Uh, in a reflective mode to a, a Dhamma Desana or a Dhamma talk is, uh, you know, just keep the mind open and receptive and then uh, how does it affect you, you know, to be aware of what I say uh, is uh, you can you can be interested in the content or you can be aware of it just as also as it uh, affects you either positively or negatively or if you're interested or bored or you agree or disagree or whatever. So you can learn to observe just what goes on uh, in your mind. Uh, being, reflecting on the way it is in terms of your own experience. So even if I give an absolutely horrible Dhamma Desana, it's still Dhamma, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) This is a, a... to train yourself, to remind yourself to listen like this is most useful because we do get caught up with our own views and opinions and likes and dislikes and and uh, doubts about things and the, the very direct way is by just watching that in the mind. How words can, or tone of voice can, can bring up a certain emotion or feeling. Just the tone of voice can, can. Uh, I remember uh, there's a man in London who who likes to give dharma talks, layman. And he one time we were at the Thai temple in in London, and and uh, I gave a talk first, and everybody was seemed to be quite grateful and agreeable and pleasant and non-argumentative and. Uh, that and then this man gave his talk, and everybody started arguing with him. <laughs> and I contemplated that because uh, everything he said, I agreed with, but I still felt I want to argue with him too. <laughs> because he just had a way of talking that made you want to argue. <laughs> Now, the Buddha, uh, the essential teaching is the Four Noble Truths. And, and in the uh, Thai forest tradition, uh, this is very much the, the, the teaching we use. Uh, we reflect on this uh, teaching until we, we have penetrated with insight the, these Four Noble Truths. We know the, the reality of those truths, not just I mean, it doesn't take long to memorize the Four Noble Truths. But, uh, as I said before, you can get a parrot to recite the Four Noble Truths (laughs) in Pali. (laughs) So that's not enlightenment, but but it's it's taking those Four Noble Truths and and really reflecting, contemplating, uh, as you, you know, internally looking at your mind, at your body, 
I remember when years ago uh, Ajahn Chah took me uh, on a kind of what we call a Tudong, Tudong walk, where we went up to the northeast uh, in Thailand. We went to visit some of the great teachers of Ajahn Man's disciples. This was must have been about 1969, about 1969. And, and so we went to see these various teachers. At that time, my, and Ajahn Chah was interested in, I mean, somebody gave him a Philips tape recorder. And, and at that time, tape recorders were rare things, and it, it wasn't the cassette type, you know, it was these reels. And, and Ajahn Chah got kind of besotted with his tape recorder and was trying to <laughs> record everything that all these Ajahns were saying. And uh, so we went to see uh, Lung Pu Kao, uh, who was a very famous old Ajahn, highly regarded in Thailand, uh, in Udon. And so I remember going there with uh, Ajahn Cha and Ajahn Maha Mon, and we we went in there, and Lung Pu Kao was a very old, very old monk at the time. He's dead, he's long gone, but this was about 1969, and he was still, he was still very feeble. But he came out, and he was in a wheelchair, and, uh, and Ajahn Chah taped his desna in, uh, the desna was in Thai, and I wasn't all that fluent yet, so I didn't really get very much. I just sat there. And then uh, as we were getting up to leave, Lung Po Cha left and Ajahn Maha Mohan left and Lung Po Kao suddenly kind of motioned to me like he wanted me to come close. He beckoned to me. So I went over close to him and he, and he pointed to his heart and he said, it's all here. He said, look at your heart. Look at your heart. And said this in Thai, and I knew enough Thai to understand that. And just the motion and the, uh, the, that, the, the fact that this, this highly regarded uh, teacher gave me this very profound Dhamma talk, but it was very simple. He said, it's here, it's all here, and he, and he pointed to his heart. So I've never forgotten that. It was, uh, even though that might not sound like tremendously profound Dharma talk, yet in the context it was, you know, it was meant a lot because over the years just that, I have that image of Lumpu Kao saying, it's in your heart, it's here, and pointing to, pointing to his own heart. So in this reflection on the Four Noble Truths, it's all in here, it's not something that you need to study uh, endlessly and, and kind of uh, think about in terms of a- analyze it with, uh, with your intellect, but to really apply it to experience. It's all in here. Four Noble Truths is here. It's not, you don't need to go to the library for this. <coughs> So the Four Noble Truths, there's, a, there's the three aspects of each truth, and so there's Four Noble Truths, three aspects, and that's so four times three is what? Twelve insights. <laughs> so there's twelve insights. The twelve insights, then once you've had these twelve insights, then, that, then you have attained arahantship. So, what does that do to your mind? (laughs) (laughs) Or realize, realize arahantship. So, arahants, then, uh, this is a a great attainment, isn't it, in Buddhist terms, uh, the ultimate, you know, fully enlightened human being. So, this word arahant is is a word that we, it also is very high up in the, it's very way up there. Who is an arahant? Who is, you know, there used to be, remember, Western monks used to come to Thailand and they say, is Ajahn Chah an arahant? And then they, they'd kind of go and they'd look at Ajahn Chah and they'd see him chewing betel nut. 
Then he'd smoke cigarettes in those days. An Arhat wouldn't smoke cigarettes. Marlboro men aren't Arahants. <laughs> <laughs> and chewing betel nut is, uh, you know, to most Westerners, it's pretty uh, unpleasant thing to, to watch. He's got kind of this, this red stuff in your mouth, and you spit it into a spittoon. And, and the Arahant wouldn't chew betel nut. And you know, these authorities on Arahants coming out of California or. <laughs> Go around looking at these Arjans. You know, go around looking for an Arhant outside. You know, where is it? Is a Lumpur cow an Arhant? Is Ajahn Mahabhu an Arhant? Is Buddha Dasa an Arhant? Is the Dalai Lama an Arhant? And so we, you know, are any of the Vipassana teachers Arhants? Nobody's raising their hand. <laughs> <laughs> so then we 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 look at it here rather than out there. Don't look for arahants out there. That that's a kind of conceit, isn't it? Who am I to go around saying, uh, "You fulfill my my uh, my ideal of an arahant"? Maybe because you sit straight and don't move. And I remember we had one monk, an American monk, for a while at Wat Nana Chat sat there perfectly still, he used to be sit for hours. And he looked blissed out and he'd sit there and we think, this guy's probably an arahant. We found out he was uh, schizophrenic. So the, the first noble truth I've discussed is there is suffering, suffering should be understood, suffering has been understood, the three aspects of the first noble truth. So that's the first three insights. And, and th this, is a, this is a teaching I've used over years, you know, 33, 34 years of practice. And, and something that... Uh, even though sometimes Four Noble Truth is just kind of looked at as beginner's practice, it's actually uh, a lifetime practice. It works uh, as, a, as a continuous reflection on experience. And this, um, because even though it's, it's easy enough to understand on, on one level, to, to really penetrate it with your with intuitive awareness is something else. It takes patience, a willingness to, to really endure, and to, and to sit through things until you, you really have an insight, you know something uh, from, a, from, uh, from seeing the reality of it rather than just thinking you understand it because you understand the, the theory of it. So. The first noble truth is the statement, there is suffering. Second insight, suffering should be understood. Third insight, suffering has been understood. So this, this understanding suffering is embracing pain, despair, uh, grief, sorrow, uh, anguish. Um, all your emotions, all forms of, of uh, emotional suffering, physical suffering, to understand it is to totally accept it, welcome it, to embrace it. This is a, under, it should be, suffering should be understood. And by doing that, then you, you're actually learning to, to understand suffering, to stand under it, to, to really look at, rather than just try to get rid of it. Because the un, unenlightened human being, unawakened human being, just tries to get, we just try to get rid of suffering. We just want to get rid of it and be happy. So it's like the bhutuchana is the word for an unenlightened human being. So bhutuchana is the people that are just, just looking for happiness, getting, trying to get rid of suffering as quickly as possible and find happiness. So this 
Four Noble Truths is kind of turning our attention instead of running away, trying to get rid of uh, and blame it on somebody else. We're actually welcoming suffering, welcome. Uh, oh, wonderful suffering. You've come to teach me. That kind of thing. And see, suffering as a teacher rather than as uh, uh, something that's wrong with you or with the world. We learn from suffering. So you're changing from seeing it as something's wrong, something's wrong with you, something's wrong with the world, to this is an important, uh, this is a noble truth that I must reflect upon and understand. Second noble truth is uh, there is an origin of suffering. There are causes to suffering. Suffering is, an ultim- is not the ultimate reality. So dukkha, or this is a Pali word for suffering, trans- translated generally as with the English word suffering, but this, uh, this is something that arises as a beginning has an origin, it has causes. The causes of suffering, the cause of suffering is attachment to the three kinds of desire. So these three kinds of desire, and dunha is the Pali word for desire, uh, and the English word desire has a kind of pejorative meaning to it. So it, desire always sounds like, you know, has slightly negative connotation. Dunha can, can mean uh, is desire, but it also can, we can desire to be good. And uh, we can desire to become enlightened and so forth. So desire in this case is not particularly meaning that uh, something kind of nasty or bad, but it's pointing to, uh, to that energy within us that's always looking for something. So there's three kinds of desire that that are listed in the Second noble truth, gamma dana, which is sensual desire, desire for pleasure through your senses. So, so like just you know, seeing seeing something or hearing something, sexual desire. All these things are desire are, are gamma dana, uh, and this is natural to to this state, this realm that we live in. Gamma dana, uh, the the to seek pleasure through. Uh, sensory gratification. So just contemplating gamma dunha, sens- sensual desire, is not making any statement, you know, judgment about it, but beginning to really notice this, the power of gamma dunha, how one can just be caught in an endless kind of seeking of pleasure through sensory, uh, seeking sensory pleasures. You know, like eating a lot and taking drugs and uh, is, is a kind of gamma dunha and, and the, uh, just using sexuality just for pleasure, isn't it? The way people do now, just try, trying to use sex as, as some kind of, just for the fun of it, for the pleasure of it, uh, is gamma dunha. Or they uh, just listening to beautiful music or exciting music, uh, odors, and, and uh, pleasurable physical sensations, and so forth. Gam, uh, gamma dunha. Contemplating gamma dunha, you just see that, that dunha is, is, a, is something that arises in your mind. It's not something that's permanent. And dunha always has this kind of, it kind of propels you. It's a kind of energy that's always looking for something some object to, to, to grasp hold of, something to, to, you know, it's this kind of restless energy that's always looking for something to do, something to get. So I noticed in, in monastic life, uh, you get the, these moments where you're just so restless, you want something to do. So you, I'd go back to my kuti and I'd feel this desire, to, I'd be picking up things just for something to do. Uh, I'd, I'd be, anything I could eat. You know, monks can't eat in the evening. If there's anything allowable, like they have these, what they call bitter fruits, laxative fruits that are allowed. 
they're they're very they're called myrobalan and they're very bitter, unpleasant tasting things. But Gamadana sometimes doesn't really care. It's something to eat. <laughs> so you find yourself eating these bitter fruits and then spending the night running to the loo, to the <laughs> toilet. So Gamadana can just take us over and just uh, the endless uh, kind of seeking of sense pleasure just having fun all the time. So contemplate not, not as, a, as something, you know, not, not trying to, to make out that this, is, that this is bad, but just trying to recognize this power, this force that we experience through these bodies. Because this is a sense world and a sensual world. And so there's a, this pull all the time through the senses for just the attractiveness of, that, of what we see or hear, smell, taste, and touch, and what we think. We can entertain our minds with, with fantasies, live in a world of, of entertaining fantasies. So then, then the second kind of dhanha is called power dhanha, which is desire to become something. This is like ambition or, or a kind of aspiration to become, wanting to become something, thinking, right now, you know, I want to become uh, a better person. I want to become an enlightened being. I want to become an arahant. I want to become uh, this or that because I, there's something, I'm not good enough the way I am right now. Uh, I've got to do something in order to become something in the future. So this bhava dhanha is always this, this kind of, it always seems kind of righteous in a way, doesn't it? It seems right. You know, right now I'm, you know, I've, I've had some gama dhanha problems and then, and then I've got to become somebody who no longer just under the influence of sensual desires. I've got to get, uh, I've got to, sit and practice meditation in order to become a stream enterer or become a, a, a w- once returner or become a non-returner or become an arahant, hopefully. <laughs> or some people aim for, I want to become a Buddha or a, become a Bodhisattva. Become the Maitreya Buddha. You can w- think of anything you can want to become. But it's, it's uh, this, this sense of of this mind that always thinks that, that, that I've got to do something to become something. And so just notice this, a lot of this uh, motivation in, uh, in spiritual development or in meditation is around bhava dhanha, isn't it? Always trying to, to become better at meditation or become uh, uh, or attain stages, uh, uh, kind of levels, higher levels. Uh, and so wanting to become, and it can't say, if you want to become something like a, a mafia or a criminal, that's, that's say, uh, that's bhava dana too, but most of us don't have any desire for that kind of becoming. Our, our bhava dana is usually quite high-minded, isn't it? Wanting to become something, a better person, uh, become more loving, become uh, more, you know, uh, uh, a finer kind of human being. So, in contemplating bhava dhanha, just n- notice that 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 in yourself it's all, that thinks like that. That always has this thinking of becoming something. You can actually. I used to just practice saying to myself, "I go into the sound of silence in the nada, settle in there." And then I'd say to myself, so I could hear. You know, I wouldn't be saying this out loud, but inwardly I'd think, I'm not good enough the way I am. I've got to do something now, practice meditation, in order to become an enlightened being in the future. And I could see, I could see this was, this was oftentimes a motivation for, for what I was doing. This idea, I'm not, 
good enough now, and I've got to become something else. So I get a feeling for this, and it seemed the right attitude too. It was, it's, you know, to admit that, you know, I'm not perfect and, and I've got a, a faults and weaknesses and I'd failures and so forth. And, and so I'm, you know, I realize I'm, I'm very imperfect and, and have many flaws and I've got to try to strengthen myself and become somebody better, somebody stronger, somebody wiser. But listening to this, you know, listening to this thing in me that would do this, I began to recognize how, how convincing Bhavadana is. And if we always grasp this bhavadanha, you're, you're always going to end up feeling you're never, you've never quite made it. You know, it's just, it's, you can see for some of you who've been practicing meditation for years, how maybe a lot of it's been through bhavadanha. So you always feel that you've never, you're never good enough or pure enough, or you've never quite got it, or you're not as good as you should be. You're not enlightened yet. You've got to work harder in order to become something in the future. So in contemplating Bhava Dhanha, you just get a feeling for that whole, that whole kind of uh, mood and, and attitude, that desire to, to become something else, become someone else. Becoming. The third kind of dhanha is a whippawa dhanha, which is desire to get rid of things. Bhava is becoming and whippawa is to get rid of. So it's an annihilating desire, desire to get rid of anger, desire to get rid of suffering, desire to get rid of of greed, hatred, and delusion, desire to get rid of bad thoughts, desire to get rid of immature emotions, desire to get rid of of uh, annoying insects, uh, mosquitoes, uh, desire to get rid of the defilements. So this this also is quite as a righteous sound to it to get rid of the devil, isn't it? To get rid of Mara. Kill the devil, uh, beat the devil, uh, kill the maras, kill your defilements, uh, destroy the evil forces. This is a vipavadanha, and that's that's like you know that's fundamentalism, isn't it? You know, kill the devil, get rid of things. And that, that has, and just notice the feeling of that, that desire. It's annihilation, desire to annihilate things, get rid of, destroy what you don't like, what you don't want, what you think is bad. So in, in my early practice, I contemplated these three until I really understood them in terms of my own experience. I could see so much of my practice was Bhavadana vipavadana, wanting to become, wanting to get rid of things, wanting to get rid of, of uh, bad thoughts, or get rid of anger, get rid of jealousy, get rid of fear, get rid of sleepiness, get rid of restlessness, get rid of doubt. I wanted to get rid of it all. And I wanted to become someone who got rid of everything. So one of one of these these lessons you learn in meditation when in the when I was a samanera, I went through this stage where I was getting really good samadhi, I was really peaceful. And for the first several months I went through utter hell. The first two months of my meditation practice as a samanera, well I I fell into hell realm for two months. Maybe longer than two months. It seemed like forever. When you're in hell, it, it seems like forever. And so eternal hell, isn't it? 
That's what eternal hell is. It's not really eternal. It just seems eternal when you're there. And uh, because all these negativities se- seem to kind of uh, well up in my mind. And I just sat there for two months in this kuti in Nongkai with anger and all ki- uh, re- just feeling hatred for everybody, hatred for myself. But I, I stuck it out. I managed to stay with it. And eventually, all this kind of, just by learning to be patient, accepting, and bearing with this misery, it, it kind of cleared. It was kind of uh, like a catharsis. It all eventually seemed to dissolve. And then I was sitting there, you know, and, and thinking, feeling quite good, feeling calm. And then Suddenly this, this thought came up in my mind, and it was kind of a, uh, an annoying thought. It wasn't a bad thought. And this thought was, it was a, a, a funny kind of thought. I couldn't figure out why I was thinking it. And said, the thought was, Gwendolyn, what are you to me? <laughs> so... Uh, maybe there's some significance to this thought. Uh, why would I even think Gwendolyn is not particularly? So I, I tried to analyze what, is, what does it mean. I remember in, when I was in primary school in Seattle, there was a girl named Gwendolyn. <laughs> maybe I had a secret fondness for her, but I remember not liking her very much. <laughs> And anyway, this, this, this thought kept coming up. I'd be sitting there, and, and, and I, was, I was, you know, wanting this tranquility, this kind of blissful state, and then this stupid thought, saying, Gwendolyn, what are you to me? <laughs> so I started you know, get rid of this. And the more I started resisting it, the more obsessed I came with this thought. Pretty soon I couldn't, every time I sat down, I would be thinking this thought all the time. So I began to not even want to sit anymore, because it's just an endless battle with this stupid thought. It wasn't even an intelligent and interesting thought. Then, then I started, I'll do walking practice. I went outside and walked, but the thought started coming up even when I was walking. And, and so I couldn't get away. And I wake up in the morning, Gwendolyn, what are you to me? <laughs> Uh, and the more I thought about this, the more I just was, you know, I've got, to, I've got to be stronger. I've got to be more tough and kind of really get rid of this thought. And the, the more determined I was to get rid of it, the more obsessed I became with it. So finally, one day after going through, through this endless struggle with this, thought, suddenly I, I realized that I, that I was resisting it, that I wanted to get rid of this thought. So I started thinking, well, Gwendolyn would argue, that's fine, mm-hmm. not making a problem about it. And then it dropped away. <laughs> it wasn't a problem. Once I accepted it for what it is, but it was the aversion to it. It really, it really, that one thing taught me an important lesson, had a strong insight into the more you resist and fight and struggle, the more obsessed you become, the more attached you become to something. So like this whip of Wadanha, wanting to get rid of something, uh, was what made me more, made me think about it all the time, that I couldn't think anything else until I accepted, so I saw that and stopped resisting, and then, then actually it wasn't a problem at all. Because I wanted to become peaceful and tranquil and blissful, and I didn't want to sit there with, with that thought going through my mind. There was the bhavadhanha, desire to attain a state of bliss and tranquility, and when I didn't get it, trying to the the desire, the whipper were done. I trying to get rid of the thing that was in the way. So this is a way of contemplating 
these three kinds of desire. Just in, in your own, just here on this retreat, you begin to just notice the, the, this in, in your own practice, how much practice is motivated by trying to become something and try, or trying to get, attain something, trying to get rid of something. And, and, and so it's important to study these desires, not to just think, because trying to get rid of desire is vipavadanha. So the more you try to get rid of your desires, then you're, then you're caught in the trap, like Gwendolyn, what are you to me? You're stuck there. The more you, you try to get rid of desires, the more obsessed you are with them. So the important thing is to understand desire, and oftentimes... The first noble truth is called the truth there is desire, there is dunha. So you can put dunha even in the place of dukkha, or instead of suffering, there is desire. So in order to, 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 this gives you an opportunity to really understand the power of desire, what it is as experience, not as, not a judgment of it, but recognize it's a kind of, it's a, it's an arising of energy in the, in your mind that, that is looking for something, either for sense pleasure or for becoming something, or it's looking or it's trying to get rid of something you have now that you don't want. So it's, it can be very destructive. And then so much whipple what done is is the, is what's going on now in the world in uh, Kosovo and places like that. Just trying to get rid of the enemy. Get rid of the Albanians. Get rid of this or that. And it, it's a, it, so the Vipavadanha that that we have in our mind, it's it you know it generates out into the society trying to get rid of this, get rid of that, is uh, is one of the you know delusions of the uh, that we all share in throughout the, this planet trying to become and trying to get rid of. So in reflective meditation, you're contemplating this. You know, what is Gamadana like this, feels like this, wanting something. Like just see the power of, of attract, looking at a beautiful flower. You can see, or a beautiful color, or whatever. Something that's beautiful, you feel beauty attracts. You know, with the eye, you see something it attracts, you feel attraction is a pulling toward the object. Make, and then you form a desire wanting that, that beautiful object. So the feeling of beauty impinges on your eye, say, for example, just eye aware of consciousness, and then, then the desire, I want that. And, and so you follow that desire, the sensual, sensual desire, or the desire to become a desire to get rid of. Then the insight, that's the, 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 the this, these three kinds of dunha, an attachment to these three desires is the cause of suffering. Dunha itself is not the cause of suffering. Attachment to dunha is the cause of suffering. So recognize that, that we're not blaming dunha for suffering, but this blind attachment out of ignorance, we grasp these desires, and then, and then, uh, that is the the origin or the cause. Grasping desire is the cause of suffering. So then, the prescription is to let go of the causes. So, so the. The uh, fourth insight is there's the origin of suffering, which is grasping desire. And the fifth insight uh, is, the, is the insight, uh, these three kinds of desires should be relinquished. Let go of these three kinds of desire. Don't just, when you, under, when you see them and you understand what grasping is, and let, let go, let go of desire. Which is not getting rid. It's not vipavadanha. It's not getting rid of desire, is it? 
but it's letting go. So there's a difference between getting rid of and letting go. Getting rid of is always implies aversion and ignorance and 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 vipavadanha to get rid of something. But so but this letting go is not vipavadanha. It's an insight into letting desire go, letting it be what it is, and it goes naturally if you just leave it alone, it'll go away. Just like Gwendolyn, what are you to me? It just naturally went away once I let go of it. It's not the ultimate reality. Then the sixth insight is, or the third aspect of the second noble truth is uh, desire has been let go of. So you have these three three aspects. The first one is a statement, there is suffering, there is the cause of suffering. The second aspect of, of these first two noble truths, suffering should be understood, and for the second noble truth, the causes should be let go of. Then the third aspect of the first noble truth is suffering has been understood and the third aspect of the second noble truth is suffering has been let go of. Now notice that, that's, that the, this, is, this is the, those are the first six insights into the four noble truths. Well, this, this might sound, you know, a bit complicated, but it, it, is a, it is a form which is very useful over the years to learn because it, it's a reflective form. It's not just to, to be a clever person knowing the three aspects of the Four Noble Truths and the Twelve Insights. If somebody says, what are the three aspects of the Four Noble Truths and the Twelve Insights? And you can go, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. It's not, not like that. It's, it's really using that to, 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 to uh, penetrate, to, to know this in a direct way, this direct knowing, insightful knowing, intuitive realization. <laughs> so, when you, let's say, in the uh, dependent origination teaching, this Paticca Samupada, this is about uh, the second noble truth, the ignorance, uh, not understanding the four noble truths, in the terms of, of Buddhism, uh, ignorance doesn't means not understanding the four noble truths. There are three aspects and twelve insights. So as long as as long as uh, that is the case, then then there's this avicca or ignorance that that takes us into suffering. Avicca, ignorance is always the result of anything you do out of ignorance will end up as dukkha, as suffering. So, so, and don't believe this. So this is something to, to contemplate. So that's why even though, you know, even success in the world, in praise and, and all the rest, you know, the more we operate in the world out of ignorance, not understanding the way things are, not having, not having penetrated these Four Noble Truths, then the result is a sense of always anxiety, worry, uh, dissatisfaction, fear, desire, uh, are the results of our lives that, that come out of this ignorance. So now, say, you're in this, this, op- you're in this state now of, of awakened awareness, you're now awakening, you're using the awakened mind, the, you're, you're, you're paying attention now, looking here, looking at your heart, so that, and using dukkha and suffering as, as the kind of, that's the clue the Buddha gave. Something that's quite ordinary. Dukkha is, is the common bond of humanity. In Thailand, oftentimes monks will talk to a group, instead of saying, ladies and gentlemen, they'll say, 
brothers and sisters in old age, sickness, death, and suffering. <laughs> it's kind of a bond we all share, isn't it? Every human being, everywhere. When you think of like all uh, in Africa or in Asia or South America or uh, Eskimos or the Russians or the Kosovars or the Albanians or the Serbians or the Americans or whoever, the common bond is suffering of, of humanity, isn't it? When you contemplate this, how can you go around looking at, you know, through, through racial prejudices or things like this? To, be, to hate another group of people, you, you can't think about the common bond of suffering you share with them. You've got to think about how you don't like how they, this group used to exploit and persecute your group. And then you, oh, you're going to whip a wadana, get rid of the so-and-sos arises. But when you start using suffering as, a, as the kind of clue, the key to enlightenment, then, then it brings a finer quality of mind, a kind of compassion and a respect for, for life. Uh, and, and a c- compassion for the, the suffering of humanity rather than uh, just uh, racial preferences or class identities or, or uh, snobbery or the, these kind of tendencies of the human mind when we, when we look, at, uh, look at the world through cultural biases. Because these are noble truths, not cultural truths. So letting go of the causes, to let go, you need to understand what clinging to desire is. Like, Gwendolyn, what are you to me? And that clinging to that desire to get rid of that thought. And that's what the real upadana is the word for clinging and attachment. You know, the, I want to get rid of that thought. I'm sitting here. Gwendolyn, what I, I want to get rid of it. And, and, you know, just resisting, fighting it, trying to push it away is the clinging to it. And then to get, try to get rid of something, you're actually clinging to it. So, or say, becoming, wanting to become. So you start meditating, I'm going to practice in order to become enlightened. And, and so you, you operate from bhavadanha, your meditation life, your spiritual development is all based on bhavadanha, trying to become something. So then, then there is a question, have, what have you become so far? How many of you spent years on meditation retreats? Have you become a stream enterer yet? A sotapanna? Have you become a non-return, uh, uh, a once-returner, or non-returner, or let's just not talk about that, uh, not to mention arahants, or nibbana. Let's not even talk about nibbana because uh, we don't dare. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's so, uh, we don't want to, you know, think about that because it seems so kind of difficult and remote. So we, we work on oftentimes becoming something, getting through the, oftentimes in, in meditation, the Burmese practice is a, a very much a, a method based on developing the 16 stages to stream entry. So remember people years ago, I used to know, used to do that, used to always be, what stage are you? <laughs> Fourth stage. Remember one monk, after years, I said, have, have you got beyond the fourth stage? He said, not yet. <laughs> he said, somebody else uh, who just came, he wasn't a monk very long, got into the sixth stage. But he's, this one was stuck in the fourth stage. This, is, this was not even stream entry yet. It was the 16 stages to stream entry. This is all based on Abhidhamma teaching. And so the People are trying to get into the next stage and it's based on becoming, bhavadanha, isn't it? Just, it's just a, a trap to try to get into the next stage. Where they, in the 
reflection on the fourth noble truth, you're, you're observing that very, you're, you're looking very directly at bhavadanha, and you're not, to see what it is, see yourself, try and, you know, that, that desire to become something, to get something you don't have yet. What is that like? What does that feel like? And so then you, you're, you're contemplating that feeling of that kind of thing in yourself that's uh, trying to get something you don't have yet. Sometimes you don't even know what it is, but you have a feeling you've got to get something. You've got to become something. Uh, and, it, and it becomes, it takes you over. And, you don't, and, and it can be subtle, so you don't even know, to, know what you're doing. You're just caught into it. So in this, this way of reflecting, you're actually observing that. Like, Gwendolyn, what are you? I don't want that. I don't want that stupid thought. Get caught in my resistance to it. Or, the moment I began to see my resistance, I began to really know this, what this resistance was doing was attaching me to this, grasping this thought in, in a way of rejecting, rejecting, rejecting. I was actually holding on and, and rejecting at the same time. So, once I saw that, I, I could let it go. I didn't destroy the thought out of aversion. I it just let it go and it dropped. So then you, you began, then that leads on to the third noble truth, which is the ces, thus, uh, cessation of suffering, dukkha niroda, which is the cessation of suffering, realizing the cessation of suffering. So this is a, a good practice, and on the state of as you're calming your mind, and your the retreat goes on to, to to take time to look at this these uh, three kinds of desire to get to know them, not to get rid of them, to get to know them. So, so you know what they are when they come, what they feel like when you t- when they take you over when and and. So that, you, you know, when something, when you really know what it is, then you can let it go. If you, if you just got abstract ideas about you shouldn't have, be grasping desires, then you don't even know when you have desire. Isn't it? You're just taking a stand against desire, which, you know, is only based on an ideal, not on, on understanding and knowing the, the result of grasping desire. So co- contemplate this. I encourage you to contemplate these. These and, and this is the second noble truth: the three kinds of desire. The insight should, you know, let go of these causes. What do we mean by letting go? In order to let go, really know, really feel the the power of attachment of ubadana. This ubadana. So then, by by recognizing that, then you, then you you have the insight. Desire should be let go of, and then, then you you practice to let go. You you begin to recognize just letting things be, letting things go, letting things be what they are is letting them go, not struggling, resisting, controlling, trying to get something, trying to get rid of something, but just letting it be this way. It will go. And then you have the insight that the causes of suffering have been let go of. So this is the way to, to say, develop reflective awareness through the, four, through the uh, four Noble Truths in regards to uh, your own experience. So I offer this as a reflection for this evening.